Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. First, um, let me express my condolences for the loss of the great king. And I would like to start out by thanking the um, Professor Prapan, who throughout my career has been um, an incredible inspiration and colleague. Professor Kia, who is a crusader in the AIDS um, epidemic. Um, and I'd also just like to say, I have to say those pictures um, filled me with emotion, seeing the pictures again of Yup and Jacqueline. I knew Yup for over 20 years and worked side by side with him in the HIV response. And um, I'm still grieving for him, but I draw inspiration from him um, and with my work, and particularly when I'm addressing um, controversies. And um, we, over the years, were in many, many debates, and neither of us backed down, but we had good conversation, good dialogue, and if you can't see my battle scars, I have many. And um, I just want to inspire you, particularly for the young people sitting in the room, we need you. Don't shy away from controversy, and, um, which is what I'm going to be uh, talking about um, in my lecture this morning. Um, I don't know who gave me the title for this talk, but I absolutely loved it. It completely reminded me of Youp. It would have been just a way he would have um, asked the question. So um, thank you to whoever came up with the title of my talk, which is um, same day ART, and I'll insert one word, throwing caution to the wind. Okay, so. Um, let me start by just my disclosures. I receive uh, research funding from NIH um, and receive um, antiretroviral therapy from a study I'll talk about in um, a later session. And I also serve on advisory board um, with the Gillian Vatican collaboration, which I might say was started by Yuplange. Okay, so we are talking about same day ART start throwing caution to the wind. So I thought I would start out by at least having some definition. What are we talking about when we say same day ART? So for the purposes of this talk this morning, we will say that same day ART start is starting ART upon HIV diagnosis or at least within 72 hours. That is to say that an empiric antiretroviral regimen is selected and then adjusted later as needed. HIV counseling is provided over the early course of ART versus everything before our client starts and being a requirement to start ART. Um, same day ART start, I know um, this is, room is filled with clinicians, I'm also a clinician. We don't make any decisions in medicine um, not thinking. Of course you still have to think, and there's some patients where simply AR, same day ART start um, is not indicated, such as a patient who has active uh, cryptococcal meningitis and who has just presented. In that case, it's better to delay. So um, I was hoping to have audience response for this um, slide, but what I'm going to ask you to do, I'm going to read, I want to ask you all a question. And remember, this is the Youp Longay lecture. You have to have an opinion. That's the one requirement for this lecture. So you need to pick one of these four things up here and raise your hand, okay? So just take a moment to, to read these. So number one, don't raise your hand yet. This approach is unnecessary and potentially dangerous. Number two, there is no evidence base for such an approach. Number three, well, I might do this in select circumstances, but logistically, this, this is very difficult. And number four, I routinely practice this approach, okay? Um, so, number one, this approach is unnecessarily and potentially dangerous. Thank you for raising your hand. Okay, if you were in San Francisco, people would raise their hand for this. I really appreciate it. Okay, I see some other hands back there. Okay. Second, there is no evidence base, i.e. randomized control trials for such an approach. Okay, same thing. I might do this in select circumstances, but logistically this is very, very difficult. Super interesting. Okay, that, that, that wins it. Okay. And then I routinely practice this approach. Okay. So what we're going to do is at the end of um, my lecture, we're going to redo this and see if there's anything 
Gosh, that you learned during the lecture, I hope something that will um, shift you from one category to another. Okay, so I'm an, an academic, and I like to start with theses or hypothesis. So this is the theses um, for my remarks this morning. Same day ART start, when delivered in a way that supports the patient maximally, can be beneficial in the short and long term for the patient and also for the public health. So now I want to talk about what are the reasons why we would do same day ART start. And I would argue that all, I'm going to list three things on this slide and all of these are evidence based. So first of all, we can preserve immune function and reduce the HIV reservoir size. So we all know based on now large, robust, randomized trials that every day one waits before they start a ART, it reduces the risk of HIV complications, whether that be TB, traditional HIV related opportunistic infections or um, cardiac disease or liver disease or renal disease associated with the inflammation presumably from HIV. So that's evidence based. Secondly, immediate ART is associated with a reduction in the size of the HIV reservoir during acute infection. This has been shown for many, many years, many studies over and over. The, you know, the Achilles heel of curing patients is the reservoir. And presumably we think if we can minimize from the get-go the size of that reservoir, as we move into curative approaches to HIV, it's going to be easier in patients who have a smaller reservoir. That's not proven, that's speculation. But I would argue that's uh, a strong argument for potential earlier um, HIV cure options if we start our patients right away, particularly for those who have acute or early HIV infection. Secondly, why same-day ART start? Improve linkage to care and care engagement. So uh, HIV testing and HIV care are often at different locations. For example, in San Francisco, we have I don't know, probably 100 places where you can get HIV tested, but not, not 100 places where you can get care for HIV. And is that the case, nod your head, yes or no, for most people who are sitting in the audience here? Are there a lot more testing locations than care locations? Oh, come on guys, wake up, wake up. I don't see, it's either this or this. <laughs> okay, okay, can't tell, okay. Um, we know that the longer the time, at least what's in the published literature, between testing and linkage, the greater the risk for loss to follow-up. And we know that loss to follow-up is associated with higher mortality. So if you get tested somewhere in the community, you never m make it to a place to get your care, your disease is going to progress, and in many cases you can succumb to the complications of HIV. And finally, um, also evidence-based from a public health approach, we offer treatment to all people living with HIV for the benefit of their own health. But we also know, thanks to the randomized 052 trial, that treating people with HIV has the great secondary benefit of reducing transmission. So if we treat people immediately on diagnosis, we get faster reduction in HIV RNAs, RNA levels. And because transmission is related to HIV RNA levels, we get reduced onward H HIV transmission. So those are very three compelling arguments why we should be doing same-day ART start. Okay, so what are the reasons why most people are um, not doing same-day ART start uh, on the planet right now? Okay, so um, there are, I would say, three major reasons. Um, the first one is patient readiness, and the principle here being avoid harm to the patients. So this has been said for years and years and years in the HIV epidemic. Patients are in shock with a new HIV diagnosis. They need support and education in order to commit to a lifelong therapy. And this is perhaps a point that I have the most battle scars on. I always make the argument if that one has a myocardial infarction and you're in the intensive care unit, they don't say, oh, well, let's talk about it. I'm not sure if you're going to be able to take medicines for the rest of your life. They say, look, 
You need these medicines now, and they're going to be saving your life, and you need to take them for the rest of your life. So I think we made some exceptionalism here in HIV, all in good intention, because if patients don't take our therapy right, I mean, I myself can criticize this analogy, you don't get resistance to your cardiac medicines, right? So we were doing that because we wanted to preserve our medicines and reduce HIV resistance. Um, but the belief that people can't commit to lifelong therapy in the acute setting and that people starting the same day will have worse adherence, there are no data to support those beliefs. Okay. The second reason is that the provider is not ready. Okay. You know, one can say, well, gee, uh, if you don't have the labs, you don't know what their renal function is, if you don't know what the drug resistance, you um, are not able to um, select a regimen. And in order for, to give the um, best regimen to the patient, you need to have a relationship with the patient to select an optimal regimen. Now, I must say, I, I would give credence to these points. They're, 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 it's a viewpoint designed to avoid harm to the patient. Um, but once again, this is not um, evidence-based. And you'll see, I'll tell you what we do in San Francisco, we're like the drug resistance capital of the world for newly infected patients, that it's possible um, to do this and then to refine later and keep the patient safe. Um, and then finally, and I think this speaks to um, the question that I asked at the beginning of the talk, system readiness, um, which has to do with um, logistics. And I don't um, um, pretend to know um, here in Thailand and in Asia what the system readiness or logistical issues are. Um, the issues that um, we have in San Francisco and where I work in Africa, um, the clinic has to have the capacity to fit in a new patient. In the United States, we have huge health insurance barriers. We have so many different kinds of health insurance, and it's very, very fragmented. This takes huge amounts of um, hours. And so often, um, this is, uh, uh, this is a, um, a barrier to starting therapy on the same day. So um, those are the, the main reasons why people around the world are saying we don't do same day ART start. Just like to point out, for pregnant HIV women, there, there's not like really an option. Um, we have to start pregnant women right away um, because um, of the risk to, uh, for perinatal transmission. So now um, what I'd like to do is to go to the data, go to the evidence. And I'd like to address this question, are what do randomized controlled trials tell us? And there are th the results of three trials I would like to um, share with you very succinctly. One from South Africa, one from Uganda, and one from Haiti. And I'm very sorry if there's been a trial done here in uh, Thailand or Asia, but I was unable to find it in my um, review of the literature. So the first study, called RAPID, was conducted in South Africa, and this is published in PLOS Medicine. And this is a randomized controlled study. And the hypothesis of this study was same-day ART will increase uptake and improve health co outcomes compared to the standard of care, what the clinics are doing. This study um, was uh, conducted in two public sector clinics in South Africa, and the inclusion criteria were adults over 18 years of age. Um, no pregnant women were included in this study. And in order to qualify to be in this randomized trial, one had to have a new HIV diagnosis or be eligible for treatment. This is done in the time before South Africa changed its policy that there was a CD4 criteria to start ART. So the intervention, um, the rapid intervention, on visit one, there was a point of care CD4 if needed, point of care TB test if symptomatic, point of care blood test. We actually don't have these, but I know there are point of care blood tests, for example, to examine renal function. Of course, we could always get a point of care hemoglobin. Um, exam, education, and counseling, and then same day ART. So that's the intervention. The hypothesis this is going to be better or lead to more people taking antiretroviral therapy earlier than the, the control. So this, I just love this, this description of what the standard of care was at the Kroll that was happening on site at the studies when this was being done. So there's six visits, okay? There's first you get the T cells and you do the TB screen. Then you say to the patient, come back for visit two. You look at the T cell results. Then you look at the TB results and then you do blood draws if needed. Then, visit three, the patient has to come back again and go to group counseling. And just to make sure 
Visit four is more individual counseling. And then visit five is pr provide results and other blood testing, conduct the exam, confirm a treatment buddy. And treatment buddy is someone who um, comes to the, who helps the client be adherent to the antiretroviral therapy. And then finally on visit six, antiretroviral therapy was started. So what happened? So in this study, the rapid patients, the ones who got the intervention, started sooner. They randomized 463 patients. This was an individual randomization. And um, there were 377 patients eligible. 97% of the patients in the rapid start group, you can see in the um, blue line, had started ART by um, 90 days. So you can see here. And three quarters of those started actually um, on the same day. And just to give you a sense of how long this initial visit um, uh, lasted, because this may speak a little bit to your um, hesitation and how can you get everything done on the first visit, the rapid patients in their clinic spent 2.5 hours on average at their um, ART start visit. So not only did more patients start therapy earlier, but they had better clinical outcomes. So the virologic suppression was 64% versus 51%. I have to say, I, I have a little pause with this because this, to me, certainly does not seem high enough. Um, we, are, we should be striving for 90, 95% um, suppression. So I think it's important to know these patients certainly didn't do worse who we started rapidly. Their viral suppression rates are higher, but there is definitely um, more room for improvement. So that's study one that was conducted in South Africa. Study number two, called the START study, um, was done by our group um, in Uganda. And this was a different approach. This was a step wedge cluster randomized control study that clinics were randomized. So the hypothesis was that our START ART package will increase ART uptake at 14 days compared to the standard of care. So this included 20 Uganda public sector clinics, a total of 12,000 patients eligible, and new HIV diagnosis or CD4 new eligible were examined. And the care um, was delivered by the clinic, not by research staff. So our package was opinion leader training, coaching of frontline workers, and this is because people were, when we first introduced this concept, were completely opposed of this, point of care CD4, a flexible counseling schedule, and then a report card, a feedback to clinics on how they were doing. And for those of you who do implementation science, this was based on what's called the PROCEED framework of implementation science. And this just gives um, you an example of this report card or feedback card that we gave to the clinics. And here you can see these dashed lines here are pre-intervention and the dark lines are post-intervention. So um, we get um, more people who are um, starting on the first day. We get more people, these are all the different categories, male, female, pregnant, TB, stage four, um, starting by two weeks. And here you can see the percent in this particular clinic um, initiating over time. And the, the, our qualitative data would suggest that the providers found these data very, very useful. And also the clinics compare themselves to each other, so there was a behavioral interventions of the clinics wanting to do well. So what were the results of um, our rapid study, um, uh, this clinic level uh, randomized study? These were published in Lance, Lancet HIV this year. And what you can see, once again, um, um, more patients started therapy, actually double the patients started therapy um, by two weeks. And here you can see when we're, we've broken down, you might say, well, maybe the, it didn't happen in the men or the women or in small or large clinics or for advanced patients. But across all these different um, uh, subpopulations, we saw the same benefit of this really educational and feedback intervention we had done for our rapid ART start. So the third study um, was presented at the International AIDS Conference this year in Durban um, from Haiti. And the objective of this study, this study is not published, and a thank you uh, to Serena Koning who provided, provided me these slides from her Durban presentation. So the objective was to compare standard versus same-day ART, 
randomized study. Um, the inclusion criteria, um, CD4 cell count less than 500 to reflect the guidelines at the time. And you can see the exclusion criteria if someone had um, TB or they were planned to transfer. So they found uh, 1,255 patients um, with CD4 cell counts less than 500. Um, there were a fair amount of exclusions, and those were for patients who had WHO stage 3 or 4 disease um, um, or TB. Um, so um, there were 762 patients that were enrolled and randomized um, in this study. And this study actually was stopped early by the DSMB. In April of 2016, the DSMB recommended they stop the study, they offer same-day ART to all uh, subsequent um, uh, participants. So these data were um, presented um, at the, uh, the Durban meeting. And um, they had very good actually starting ART in both groups. Um, everybody started in the same day ART groups. Um, but what you can see is that there were some, and this is the reason why my understanding is that the DSMB um, recommended stopping the study earlier because there were morbidity and mortality trends um, that were statistically significant actually that favored same day ART start. You can also see here that the um, in care with uh, viral load suppression um, was greater for same day ART start compared to the um, standard group. I must, once again, must say we need to strive to get higher rates of virologic suppression more than this 50%. So um, this is a, a slide which essentially shows the cascade for these two groups always favoring the same day ART start. Here you can see initiated ART, the blue is same day, alive and in care at 12 months, and alive with um, undetectable viral load, which of course is where we want to bring our patients to. So in summary, um, there are three large randomized controlled trials that support accelerated antiretroviral treatment start. All studies showed more patients started ART with the same day versus a standard approach. Importantly, I think, no detrimental clinical effects were observed with rapid start. And one study, called RAPID, shows higher rates of viral suppression. And one study showed higher retention and lower mortality. So I think we can say that RAPID, based on these randomized controlled trials, is start is better than control, but we're still falling short in some of our optimal viral suppression targets. So now I'd like to share with you um, what we've been doing in San Francisco um, um, with rapid ART. So um, building on my theme of uh, controversial, in 2010, um, our clinic put together a policy based on the um, evidence we felt that um, where there were equipoise that we were going to offer antiretroviral therapy to every single patient in our HIV clinic at San Francisco um, General Hospital. And this received quite a bit of attention. We did this um, San Francisco style where we made our policy, we distributed it all to the patients, to the community advocates. Um, we met in the auditorium of my hospital right here. Here you can see Steve Deeks. Um, and we discussed and we debated the pros and cons um, of doing this. But we went forward, and of course patients always have a choice whether they want to um, be treated. Well, building on the heels of that, in 2013, not only did we want to offer everyone treatment, but we wanted to offer everyone same-day ART treatment. So our rationale being really what I've told you previously in the talk, many patients were lost between diagnosis and the first clinic visit, the desire to facilitate ART start in order to reduce the reservoir size. And so what we did was we developed this rapid package so we had opinion leader training of nurses, social workers, physicians, community members. Services were available to address insurance and social issues, including addiction, housing, mental illnesses. We ensured that we had a flexible counseling session, and then we did feedback on ART START compared to prior years um, in clinic. So let me just drill down a bit and um, tell you how this works. So this is a picture of uh, our clinic, our, our clinic's on the sixth floor. And so what happens when a person's identified at one of our outpatient clinics and the emergency room is that there is a text message sent to our rapid point person. 
that there's a new HIV infected patient in the hospital on campus or somewhere in our community um, um, that we are allowed to see that patient uh, at San Francisco General at least for a couple of days to get them started on ART. Okay. So when we get that text message, we do, um, we talk to the provider or person in the ER, we do a same day or next day appointment and the patient comes to our clinic, they're, meet, they're meet and greeted by the physician, by the nurse, by social worker and eligibility. We always have a physician on call essentially 24-7 in order to um, uh, initiate same day ART start. We draw labs, we actually start medication. Um, before the labs are provided and then we do very very close follow-up with patient in the coming week and then there's transition to the primary care. Now the primary care often is not the doctor who first met the patient and started ART. It actually could be a doctor at an entirely um, other clinic but we are very insistent on something we call warm handoff. We make sure that there's good communication between the providers and the patient is always welcomed by the next provider team that's going to take care of them. So what you can see here, um, we published the results of this um, uh, recently in JADES. This is when we in our hospital, just looking at timing of the engagement, what was happening when we were using CD4 guided, we had this first clinic visit, here's days here on the x-axis, first primary care visit, finally ART is prescribed. When we did universal ART, um, you can see this is when we started ART, and then when we did um, uh, rapid, we essentially collapsed the treatment cascade. And we reduced time to viral suppression at San Francisco General Hospital to 56 days. So here you can see CD4 guided universal ART. Now, I, I must say, we have complicated patients at San Francisco General. We largely take immigrants, not insured patients. And 20, just to let you know a little bit about our patients, 25% of them had acute HIV, 42%, and I would surmise this is probably an underestimate, had, have had major mental health issues. 42% were um, using illicit substances or had a recent history and speed, unfortunately, is a drug of choice um, in our clinic. And 28% of these individuals were homeless. So this is a very, very challenging population. So if I were you sitting in the audience, these are some of the questions I would be asking. Okay, well, what was the uptake by the patients? Well, 90% did same day, 94% in the first 24 hours. Second, what regimen did most patients start? They started dolutegravir plus FTC plus um, tenofovir. And HLA B57 was sent on them to see if they could switch over to Triumec. So how many patients switched regimens? Two switched for a rash. 10 uh, switched for simplification, and that mainly was to switch to a single pill regimen to try Umec after the HLA B57 results came back, and none had a switch for drug resistance. In San Francisco, we do have high levels of drug resistance. The, the, the one that's most problematic for us is NNRTIs. Because we're using integrase inhibitors of our first line that really abrogates, abrogates or reduces that particular challenge. How many patients were lost to follow-up? 10%. And honestly, for us, our main challenge in San Francisco is housing. Uh, many of our patients are mar what we call marginally housed. They ca they're couch surfing. And um, uh, this, this can be a, a big challenge for continuity of care. Just want to share with you one anecdote, um, because it's something we learned doing this. So this patient is, called, is SV. He was a 22-year-old Hispanic male, informal labor worker. He was seen in a primary care clinic for rash um, and suspected syphilis. He did have syphilis. His HIV rapid test and confirmatory test was positive. So he came to our clinic the same day. He's well-developed, well-nourished. He had a rash on his palm soles and um, torso, very classic for secondary syphilis. He was tearful, confused, not sure what to do. But there was something that happened during this clinic visit and we were sitting there and um, he called his mother and this is what he said to her, Mama, I need to tell you that I have HIV infection, but do not worry, I started treatment today and the doctors tell me I'm going to be okay. So all the clinicians know in the room that disclosure is really a very, very big challenge for patients when they're immediately infected. But somehow starting antiretroviral therapy and doing something with the disease and our qualitative studies, which is exemplified by this patients, seem to empower patients for disclosure. And we think that this is probably a good thing. 
So RAPID, the same day ART start, is a key initiative, our Getting to Zero program in San Francisco. We have three initiatives. We're doing PrEP, RAPID, and retention. And so what we did was we mapped all the places, and this is, like I said, there's probably 50, 60 places under these umbrellas where people get tested. And then we mapped all the places where people could start. And so what happens, each of these is matched with, with a place, depending on the insurance, where a patient can get care. Um, if the test is done at a place without care, then we actually Uber the patient over to the clinic. So we just do send them over, we greet them, we welcome them, and we do same, we offer them same day ART start. And um, we started this program just at our hospital, but even in the city of San Francisco, now we've expanded it out. You can see that the time of diagnosis to viral suppression has gone down to 87 um, days. Ours in the clinic is about um, two months. So um, we can't, uh, uh, claim cause and effect from this, but just to look in San Francisco what's happening just in terms of um, our universal ART, you can see here it was in 2010, we started PrEP a little bit after 2012, RAPID in 2013, and um, our number of new cases um, is now down to 255. The knowledge gaps that we have, exportability, how well will it work in other settings and how does it need to be adapted, long-term retention, understanding barriers for the, those persons for who RAPID does not work, and social science, patient and provider attitudes intersection with stigma and disclosure. So in summary, there is compelling evidence. So I don't think we're throwing caution to the wind with same-day ART start. I think we are embracing the evidence because there is compelling evidence of a benefit to the individual for same-day ART start. This approach can re represent a new way of thinking that requires thoughtful education and buy-in of all team members. And I can't um, underemphasize that. The success of the program requires meeting needs of patients in local contexts, and success is start, suppression, and long-term retention with healthy living. This is actually... Um, Time Magazine did a feature on this and they put this picture. This is actually um, one of my patients who's sitting on the top of uh, the roof of our hospital. This is the city in the Castro in the background. And he had a sad but happy story. He went to get PrEP at times where there was a big payment to get PrEP. He wanted to get PrEP. He knew he was at risk, but he, he couldn't get it because he couldn't pay. So he actually got HIV infected. When he got infected, came right to our clinic started therapy from a different doctor, not me, then his, his care was transferred over to me. And at the time when I met him, he was um, not employed. Um, fast forward to about a year and a half later, he has a great job, he's a manager in retail, and doing uh, very well, now he has private insurance. So um, that's uh, just a story to put this, make this all real. Okay, so now, finally, just to wrap this up, um, my question for you, um, these are the choices, I made them a little bit different. So this approach is unnecessary and potentially dangerous. There's no evidence base for such approach. I might do this in select circumstances, but logistically this is very difficult. I think this approach should be considered. Raise your hands, please. Oh, good. Well, some converts. <laughs> thank you, thank you. <laughs> and another important one, I am interested in doing more research in this area. We'd love to see some data from Thailand and Asia. Ooh, wonderful. Great. Okay. So um, finally, just acknowledgments to all the wonderful people I work with in San Francisco and around the world. And uh, from the Roman lyrical poet, I love this quote, begin, be bold, and venture to be wise. So thank you very much.